My name is Adam Bellow. I'm a book editor at HarperCollins, uh, and I'm the editor of a new book published by the Templeton Press called New Threats to Freedom. It wasn't until I sat down and read the whole stack of essays from beginning to end that I began to see some patterns. Uh, uh, one of the, one of the uh, recurring themes, for example, is the concern about the abuse of the idea of fairness. Um, this was something that has been bothering me you know, ever since the Obama election because we're constantly being told that, you know, that we need more fairness. Uh, and so I, you know, I did explicitly ask one or two people to, to tackle this idea and other people just spontaneously went there on their own. So it does seem to me that this is one of those, you know, one of those buzzwords that has entered into the public lexicon that, that whose content really needs to be um, uh, unpacked and critically examined. So that was one thread that, that runs through the, through the book. But I think, um, taken as a whole, the thing that I like about the collection is its idiosyncrasy. The fact that it's a collection of, uh, of essays by people who are very distinct in their way of thinking and writing and expressing themselves. They typically don't belong to any school of thought. I, I, was, I particularly went out of my way to commission pieces from literary authors, people like Mark Halperin, the novelist, David Mamet, the playwright, um, Shelby Steele, who is somebody I consider to be a literary uh, intellectual, although he doesn't produce uh, literature. Um, because, I, because I've always felt that, um, uh, that the literary mind has a sort of breadth of humane concern uh, that we don't often find uh, in the precincts of an ideological um, shop. The more successful we've been as a, as a civilization, the more uh, the more we tend to, uh, as Machiavelli would say, we mistake our our good luck for our virtue and strength. There's a there's a tendency to to think, well, we came out on top because it was somehow destined. Um, our history is on our side, or you know, we're number one. We're the, we're the best. And uh, you know, I think we have to take seriously always the, uh, the, the admonition of our founders um, that liberty is our own individual burden, privilege, and responsibility. The generation that, uh, that I refer to as the grown-ups, the generation of you know, my father, Solzhenitsyn, the, the, uh, the great figures of the Cold War, the, intellect, the intellectual heroes of the Cold War, the people that I admired and looked up to when I was a, when I was a young book editor, um, th those people are gone now. Um, and, I did, and I did feel, as I, can, I came to feel as I was putting this collection together, that I was looking to sort of you know, replace them in some way. We, I felt that we needed to step up as a generation uh, to this challenge of, uh, of uh, reviving a discourse about freedom and democracy. But I wanted it to be uh, also different in the sense that you know, my perception of you know, what it was like to sit around the dinner table with people like you know, my father and, and, and his friends was somewhat gloomy, um, you know, perhaps because the threat of nuclear annihilation was, you know, was always hanging over us. And there was that, there was that sense of urgency of, of ultimate stakes. Uh, I don't feel that the United States is in danger of being, you know, annihilated, um, uh, uh, for example. But I, uh, but I, I do feel that we have an opportunity and an obligation as a generation to revive this concern, this traditional concern uh, with freedom. But that we we can also do it in a way that's more consistent with our temper as a generation. And we, we are, uh, we're more, I think, you know, comfortable with popular culture. There's a lot more. Uh, levity in our in our generation, and so I wanted the, our our way of embracing these issues to be uh, a little less dour and grim, and a little more uh, upbeat, more fun. The defense of freedom should be fun.